I thought it was when I looked at it before. But this is not exactly the same as this. This bump here is further out than here, and that this also has a new dot here. There are, I have found better examples, but we're unable to produce a slide. There is one example of a star patch, a light that grew in a place in 200, within 200 days. So that when the, there is in, a, in the same kind of a condition of a gas cloud, when the gas collects too much together by gravitation, stars are born. And this is the beginning of new stars. So the stars belch out dirt and gases when they explode sometimes, and the dirt and gases then collect back again and make new stars. Sounds like perpetual motion. I now uh, turn to the subject I meant to introduce, which was the experiments on the small scale to see whether things really attract each other. And I hope now that the next slide does indicate, this is the second try, yeah, Cavendish's experiment. The idea was to hang by a very, very fine quartz fiber, a rod with two balls, and then put two large lead balls in the positions indicated here next to it on the side. Then because of the attraction of the balls, there would be a slight twist of the fiber. It had to be done so delicately because the gravitational force between ordinary things is very, very tiny indeed. And there it was. And it was possible then to measure the force between these two balls. Cavendish called his experiment weighing the earth. We're pedantic and careful today. We wouldn't let our students say that. We would have to say they're measuring the mass of the earth. You know? But the reason he say that, said that is the following. By a direct experiment, he was able to measure the force and the two masses and the distance and thus determine the gravitational constant. You say, yes, but we have the same situation on the earth. We know what the pull is and we know what the mass of the object pulled is, and we know how far away we are, but we don't know the, either the mass of the Earth or the constant, but only the combination. So by measuring the constant and knowing the facts about the pull of the Earth, the mass of the Earth could be determined. So indirectly, this experiment was the first determination of how heavy or how massive is the ball on which we stand. I th it's a kind of an amazing achievement to find that out, and I think that's why Cavendish named his experiment that way instead of determining the constant in the gravitational equation. <laughs> weighing the Earth. Oh. <laughs> he incidentally was weighing the sun and everything else at the same time. <laughs> because the pull of the sun is known in the same manner. Now, one, one other test of the law of gravitation is very interesting. And that is the question as to whether the, uh, the pull is exactly proportional to the mass. If the pull is exactly proportional to the mass and the reaction to forces, the motions induced by forces, the changes in velocity, are inversely proportional to the mass, that means that two objects of different mass will change their velocity in the same manner in a gravitational field. Or Two different things, no matter what their mass, in a vacuum, will fall the same way toward the Earth. And that's Galileo's old experiment from the Leaning Tower. I took my young son of two and a half to the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and now he, every time a guest comes, he says, Leaning Tower. <laughs> so, anyhow, it means, for example, that in a satellite, uh, I mean a, a man-made satellite, an object inside will go around the Earth in the same kind of an orbit as a satellite on the outside and thus float in the middle, apparently. So that this fact that the force is exactly proportional to the mass and that the reactions are inversely proportional to the mass has this very interesting consequence. The question is, how accurate is it? And it has been measured by an experiment by a man named Ert Voss in 1909 and very much more recently and more accurately by Dickey. And it is known that one part in 10,000 million, the mass is exactly proportional. I mean, the forces are exactly proportional to the mass. How it's possible to measure without accuracy, I wish I had the time to explain, but I'm afraid I, I cannot. It's a remarkably clever. I'll give a hint, Howard. I'll give one hint there. Suppose that you wanted to measure whether it's true for the pull of the sun. You know, the sun is pulling us all. It pulls the Earth, too. But suppose you wanted to know whether you had a piece of lead here and a piece of copper here, or polyethylene and lead. It was first done with sandalwood. Now it's done with polyethylene. 
whether the pull is exactly proportional to the, to the inertia. The Earth is going around the Sun, so these things are thrown out by inertia, and they're thrown out to the extent that these two objects have inertia. But they're attracted to the Sun to the extent that they have mass in the attraction law. So if they're attracted to the Sun in a different proportion than they're thrown out by inertia, one will be pulled toward the Sun and the other away, and so hanging on another one of those Cavendish quartz fibers, the thing will twist toward the Sun. It doesn't twist to this accuracy, so we know that the Sun's attraction for these two objects is exactly proportional to their centrifugal effect, which is inertia. So the force of attraction on an object is exactly proportional to its coefficient of inertia, in other words, its mass. I should say something about the relation of gravitation to other forces, to other parts of nature, uh, other phenomena in nature, and I'll have more to say of a general quality later. But there is one thing that's particularly interesting, and that is that the inverse square law appears again. It appears in the electrical laws, for instance, that electricity also exerts forces inversely as the square of the distance, this time between charges. And one thinks perhaps the inverse square of the distance has some deep significance. Maybe gravity and electricity are different aspects of the same thing. No one has ever succeeded in making gravity and electricity different aspects of the same thing. Today, our theories of physics, the laws of physics, are a multitude of different parts and pieces that don't fit together very well. We don't understand the one exactly in terms of the other. We don't have one structure from which all is deduced. We have several pieces that don't quite fit exactly yet. And that's the reason why in these lectures, instead of having the ability to tell you what the law of physics is, I ask to talk about the things that are common to the various laws because we don't know, we don't understand uh, the connection between them, but what's very strange is that there are certain things that are the same in both. But now let's look again at the law of electricity. The law goes inversely as the square of the distance. But the thing that is remarkable is the tremendous difference in the strength of the electrical and gravitational laws. People who want to make electricity and gravitation out of the same thing will find that electricity is so much more powerful than gravity that it's hard to believe they could both have the same origin. Now, how can I say one thing is more powerful than another? It depends upon how much charge you have and how much mass you have. I'm certainly, uh, well, the, you can't talk about how strong gravity is by saying I take a lump of such and such a size because you chose the size. If we try to get something that nature produces her own pure number that has nothing to do with inches or years or anything to do with our own dimensions, we can do it this way. If we take the fundamental particles, such as an electron, any different ones will give different numbers, but to get an idea of the number, take electrons. Two electrons are fundamental particle. That's an object. It's not something I can't 